episode of Art Loft, we present The Shanty Hounds, a musical duo from the Lower Keys. Going down the ocean, lay out on the beach. Give me a survey Simon Faithful, art sale artist in residence. Raw Power, the work of sculptor Chris Scala. A studio visit with Key West artist Susan Sugar. Exploring the studios of Key West. It's all ahead in this episode of Art Loft. Funding for Art Loft is made possible by Friends of Art, Friends of South Florida PBS, the Josephine S. Leister Foundation, and Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. This project is sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. Hi, I'm Lolo Ruskin, and from the studios of Key West, this is Art Loft. Welcome to the studios of Key West, a home for the arts in the Florida Keys. Today we have Jed Dodd with us to tell us more about this organization's groundbreaking work. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for being here. Tell us about the mission of the studios of Key West. Well, our motto is live the creative life, and we like to think that we help people do that. So if you're someone who just wants to kind of explore your creative side, you can do that here. If you're a professional artist, we've got a range of opportunities and resources for you. And if you're just somebody who likes to hang out with a creative crowd, we can provide that too. Great. Uh, tell us about why variety is so important to everything you guys have going on here. Well, we do a lot of different things here at the studios. We work with performing artists, visual artists, uh, literary artists, and you know we find that the synergy that is created when you bring them all together in the same space um, is really what kind of makes the magic happen. Great. If you could describe Key West's art scene in three words, what would they be? Uh, gosh, I'd say funky, and it's grounded, and it's a welcoming one. That sounds excellent. Let's take a look around. If you're not having a good time, we're going to have to ask you to leave. That's the philosophy of the Shanty Hounds, a singer-songwriter duo based in the Florida Keys. They recently brought their eclectic sound to the Boondocks Grill and Draft House in Ramrod Key, just off of Big Pine Key. Listen in. One of the most amazing places in the world, Florida Keys. <laughs> song called My Little Island. Goodbye, Jersey. Well, the Shanty Hounds is actually uh, a collaboration between two people. It's me, Danny Hoy, and Key West Chris. It was kind of funny because she had moved here and I'd give her a set to play on my gigs. We had a friend of ours who called us up once and said, hey, I got a gig to play. You guys want to come? So I said, yeah, we went and we played. We, we had a good time. And he goes, well, we should start a band. And I said, well, I don't play any of Danny's music and she doesn't play any of mine. And he goes, yeah, we should start a band. But yeah, we've been playing now for three and a half years and we're just having a great time. We just decided to either collaborate, play music together. The Shanty Hounds, it's a duo. Sometimes it's a trio, sometimes a band, but mostly it's just me and Chris. We came up with the name Shanty Hounds because Danny and I, we live in a little tiny house. We're in the Conk Republic, so uh, the music uh, that comes from here, we could call it conk rock. And so we started calling it the, the conk rock shanty. And one day I was sitting at home and I was trying to think of a name for a band. And then we also have two dogs, which are a brother and sister. They're whippets. Whippets are sighthounds. And then Chris suggested we use the. 
because all the cool bands start with, uh, you know, the Grateful Dead, the Rolling Stones, the Shanty Hills. Thank you, thank you. That's Danny High on what we call the Kizu. And two bananas and a tambourine. Bet you didn't think you'd hear one of those instruments tonight. We love playing our original music, and Boondocks offers us that possibility to play our, our own music. Some places over the years I've seen, they would say, oh, we don't want original music. But one of the things I love about Boondocks is they don't, they don't have that restriction on you. It's just play whatever you want. I'm going to the beach. We get to introduce our songs and tell our stories, which is part of being a songwriter, is being able to explain to people in a fun way where the songs come from, how you got inspired. So that's even more exciting to us. It's great to have the experience of actually um, expressing our own songs and telling people where we're from and, and how we got to, to write these songs. The sound is also piped through the entire restaurant. So if you're up in the upper deck, which you're not in the area we are, you're still hearing us because we plug into their system, they hear it up there, and it, it's just a, Boondocks is just a great place to play, we love it. She's very versatile in her songwriting. Uh, I'd like to think I am too. And it, it, it keeps things interesting and keeps people's interest in, uh, in what we're doing. It works. Our performance at Boondocks was all original material, and the way Danny and I usually do it is she does a song, I'll do a song, and that's something that works out with both of us because it's, it's an evenly balanced thing. Also, it's good for the audience because you have this woman with this phenomenal voice uh, singing, and she does her song, and then I'll do my song, which is going to be a little bit different, well, significantly different than what she did. Not totally different, but significantly different. So it gives the audience a good uh, balance and it keeps their interest. I started performing and writing my own music to be able to perform for people who really like, uh, you know, escape is kind of music. So a lot of the songs I write are a lot about going to exotic destinations or going on a cruise or something like that. My musical influences are pretty varied. Uh, I'm not stuck on one particular thing. I've got a lot of influences from all around. It's not so much classical, but with the more popular idioms of rock and roll, blues, folk, country, good music is good music, and that's what I like. So a lot of the music when I started off playing music was more for uh, like parrot heads and fans of Jimmy Buffett because they like a, a wide variety of music. They like well-written songs. What I really love about particular types of music, especially pop music, is the hook of the music, the fact that it's melodic, it tells a story. And what I was doing was I was seeking to tell a story through song as a songwriter. Get away. I, I got into uh, music in Miami 22 years ago, and at that time in Miami there wasn't any real music scene there. When I first started coming here oh, 25 years ago, I was always extremely impressed with the quality of musicians that were here in the lower keys. It's a very high bar that is set here. And for me, I think that's really good because it makes you want to achieve that bar. It's a very, very high quality musician uh, caliber that you have here in the, in the lower keys. So I have this motto, it's better late than never. Along about 2009, I started doing open mic nights and playing music with a friend. I mean, up until then, I, I just did, uh, I was a graphic designer, uh, I did some fine art. That was in 2009. Uh, fast forward 2012, I put out my first CD, which is called Traffic Elf. Playing music is my life. I get to do that several times a week, and it's, it's, it's a great thing. I'm so happy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Art Center South Florida is known for supporting contemporary artists, and they're behind Art Sale, a residency program that marries environmentalism with art. In this short film, we follow artist Simon Faithful as he wanders Everglades National Park, visiting the famed Dome House at Cape Romano. Let's take a look. There's a process of experimentation and you have to roll with what you find and your sort of your expectations and your ideas based around maybe a photograph that you saw. It's always a case of improvising on your feet and working with what you find and it's an experiment. That's that that's what I do. I've been working with the planet, in a way, for quite a long time. And I think this idea of the sphere that I find myself on being like a kind of sculpture that I'm exploring. Many projects since then have been, in a way, reporting back from the ends of the world, trying to sort of, in a way, subjectively map this planet. It's a kind of very absurd image, this, this guy in a, in a formal shirt standing up to his neck in water. And in some ways, I guess maybe it has something of the emergency to it. It's like, why is he standing in this water? But the actual experience of standing in the water, because I was 15 minutes um, alone, quiet, that's a very unusual thing to do. And there was, there was something very kind of serene about that moment. I think it was ruins within Florida that, that I was searching for. I, and I came across them and they, they immediately just, um, from the pictures I saw online, really fascinated me as uh, sort of coming from that 70s uh, kind of space age utopia, these kind of white, um, almost like Buckminster Fuller type domes. Um, and they were built on the beach, um, but uh, Hurricane Andrew swept the whole sand spit away and now they're left sort of isolated within the ocean. The extra thing that happened was that Hurricane Irma happened between these two visits, and so two of the domes have subsequently collapsed, which is, you know, very sad for the dome homes, but from this image of a kind of a, a collapsing, misplaced utopia, sort of within six months, like the next, the next phase is kind of captured within these buildings. These are almost like an allegory. It's just an amazing thing that an oil engineer built these um, for his luxury residence on this little sand spit. And in a way, they, they sort of belong to an era when there was this feeling that we could transcend nature, that we could, we could sort of, like nature was something to be admired and looked at, but we didn't need it. We, we would be living on the moon, we would be living in bubbles under the ocean, and these dome homes have that kind of feeling. I think sort of where we find ourselves is a very precarious, strange moment. 
And I think, uh, oddly, that's also full of absurdity and some humor as well. Uh, our, our sort of precariousness. Central Florida artist Chris Scala breaks all the rules. He expresses his creativity through many different forms of art, from stone sculpture to underwater art. Let's take a look. I started out working very young in leather and always loved the making of things. And then later I started to carve marble, which I found fascinating and have since gone to work in many other materials with what I do. There's so many interesting ways to approach something, as well as so many interesting ideas. I can't imagine just doing it with the same thing over and over. Well, one of the things I like about carving stone is that it's only you and the stone. There's no foundry involved. There's no person that's responsible for providing hardware. There's no element of paints or additives. It's just the block of stone. And you carve down to the object that's in it. It's a very pure form of sculpture. So in the method where I work in cultivating artworks in the ocean, since the mid-80s, I've been working with a marine scientist in, in the Keys named Chris Olstad. We use electric current produced from photovoltaic cells, and we provoke the deposition of minerals. These are all unique to the biology of the place where they were made. The development of the material from the ocean was, was very interesting in that the marine organisms were very happy to colonize it. And here it's transformed into like a, an artifact, which should uh, earn it some respect. I've worked a lot in cast metals and also in built metals, which is when we uh, cut and weld things together. this material, a wire fabric. I have concentrated on that pretty exclusively. This piece is a, a trailer. I think that it has a, an appeal kind of to the collective memory uh, because a lot of people have some association with this shape. We've also taken advantage of the fact that it's an object that you can inhabit to uh, do performance in the piece. I've had actors installed in here, and observers will come up to it and, and want to talk to them. And It uh, has an interesting effect on people. They'll come up and, even though you can see in anywhere, they'll come up and actually look through the windows, like that's how you would see inside. The fence piece that we've just installed this last month is kind of interesting and, and a little bit of a departure for me because it really does seek to communicate with just an average person in their average day. The piece borders a car park, and you look at it closely and it does get your attention because of the scenes that are depicted. Each of the panels in it illustrate animals using cars and trucks for their purposes. It's just become another piece of furniture downtown. Material I'll acquire and learn how to use is usually driven by the idea and how I think it would best be expressed. And whatever material seems to work for that idea is where I will take it. To be able to go from material to material, I think you're more like a writer than you are a practicer of watercolor or a, a person that only works in clay. 
there's so much artwork to look at and so many ways to uh, express an idea. How can you do it with just one medium? Uh, someone certainly can, but there's just too many interesting things to deal with, too many interesting things to want to explore. A lot of the work that I do, particularly the work in the ocean, are everyday objects, but here the ordinary has been transformed into the extraordinary to draw attention to it. I think, for my purposes, to make people look at it and, and wonder how it was made and presumably why it was made. Multimedia artist Susan Sugar is a self-described painter of sea and sky. With a palette full of oils or watercolors, she captures the unmistakable vistas that make the Florida Keys so enchanting. Join us as we visit with her in her studio. Light, rhythm, poetry of place, um, other artists. These are the things that inspire me. Yes, I draw inspiration from my garden and from this space. I feel like all the elements of this space really lead me to the garden. Without the garden, the space would not be what it is. I inherited this domain from my late husband. My husband was an architect, it was his office. My name is Susan Sugar. A lot of people call me Susie, but Susan Sugar. And I'm now a painter. I was a dancer, and I think I jumped out of the womb into the arts. My background in dance really distinguishes me as a painter. I feel musical, I feel rhythmic, I feel the things that, the elements that really I worked with most of my life as a dancer, I transferred to the canvas. Nature-oriented, transcendentalist like uh, Robert Frost and Thoreau and Coco Chanel. <laughs> but it really was initially a way of digesting the changes in my life and wondering what comes next. More and more, I've skirted the edge of abstraction, which is very much like dancing. And, um, and of course, I, I'm healed. <laughs> It definitely heals you watching the sunrise every day for months at a time, so. Uh, the garden, if I'm blocked, if I'm working and I come across a block or I'm beating a dead horse or I'm stuck or I'm tired, uninspired, I go into the garden. In New York, it's very different. But here, either I'm holding a brush or I'm holding a shovel. That's the way it is here. Lucky Street Gallery discovered me in 1995. And I've always been associated with Lucky Street is now co-owned by John McIntosh and we just lost John McIntosh. It's a, a very sad moment for all of us, for the entire town, but I find it really ironic. The show is called Leaving Shore and we are going to go ahead with it as a 
tribute to his great efforts as an artist and as a owner and partner at Lucky Street. I'm very proud to be there. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of Art Loft. You can connect with us anytime online on social media at ArtLoftSFL. For Art Loft, I'm Lolo Ruskin, and I'll see you next time. Funding for Art Loft is made possible by Friends of Art, Friends of South Florida PBS, the Josephine S. Leister Foundation, and Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. This project is sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture.